This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. <laughs> we're done. Here we Ash. go. Thanks, how are you, Ash? Good, mate. Good, ah, mate. Good to Very see good. you, brother. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, a man of many talents. Author, motivational speaker, extreme kind of, you're out there doing the <laughs> thing, kind of putting your life through danger. Yeah. It's a, a, what, would you, what would you call that? Extreme adventurer? How uh, do you, what's I, the name to it? Yeah, I'm still lost as to what to call it. But yeah, you're right. Extreme athlete, extreme explorer, adventurer. Mm. Yeah, any of the above, really. Yeah, but a man who looks as if he's living his life to the full potential of what it's yes. all about. Seeing you on the Joe Rogan podcast, seeing you on the High Performance podcast. Yeah. All good guys. Really good guys. Yeah, really great good guys. storyteller. Yeah, cheers. You seem to have, like, I kind of think we all struggle through life, but you seem to be pushing it. But again, it's life or death with some of your moments, and I'm it sure is. we'll touch on through the podcast. But before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start of my guests, get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up, how it all began. Yeah, man, sure, yeah. So I grew up in North Wales, just near Clandidno there, you know, where Old Colwyn was the town. Sleepy place, mm -hmm. nice place though, right next to the coast there, you got the lakes, got the forests. Great for someone like me who likes to get outdoors. But, um, you know, I've since now moved to London. But whilst I was growing up in Wales, I was, again, normal background. You know, I went to uh, a standard high school, went on to college. And then from college, I was sort of in an outdoor education course, which was good fun. You know, I sort of learned a lot more about myself and especially the fact that I was a kinesthetic learner. You know, sort of hands-on practical experience rather than being in the classroom, being lectured at by the teacher. I just didn't learn that way. And I thought to myself, you know, whilst these students in my college course have got it all sort of figured out, some are going to the military, some are going to university, I was fucking so lost. So lost. I was like, what the fuck do I do? Um, but then I realised, well, if I learn more through experience and, you know, getting hands-on, uh, making mistakes and sort of learning from those mistakes, trying to never make, make the same mistake twice. I thought, why don't I plan to to travel? So I started to work multiple different jobs, sort of um, in a fish and chip shop, in lifeguarding. And as a waiter, I was racking up the money, cycling to and from work all day, every day on my bicycle. And at age 19, I finally set off for, for my travels. And, and that just that just changed everything. Where did you go? From there, I went straight to, to China. And China was good fun. Why China? I thought that was as foreign as it gets, you know, compared to the UK. That's, that's the most different country that I could go to. What's the difference between China and more technology there? Busier? Um, yeah, but back then in 2010, it wasn't as well developed as it is now. It developed really fast. Like it was still developed, but I do remember rocking up at the airport in Beijing and there were people on bicycles, you know, tapping on their bicycle seat, offering to give me a bunk to my hotel mm. with my rucksack, you know? But now, yeah, you, you're picked up by in, in I've Tesla's. seen as if it's more advanced. Yeah. Over in Asia, with technology, I don't know if that's it a is. good thing or a bad thing. I believe yeah. technology can fry your brain where people can get lost in it. Because it's not living. For me, it's not. I can be, if I spend over six hours a day in my phone, 
I've, yeah. I've had a bad day. I know why am I wasting my time on that, but it can just suck you right in. Yeah, it can. And I've seen that Apple have recently launched that, um, have you seen that headset yeah. that they've got now? That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. So the advert to it and like mm. the daughter coming up, collecting her breakfast, looking at her dad and the dad's just wearing this big mask on his face. It's like, where's the connection there? Mm. Swiping in, pulling in apps. It's, it's mental. It's mental. But now, yeah, you're right. China is very, very advanced. I remember like, what, four or five years ago, they would be purchasing everything on their phone and that was weird to me i was still sort of using cash mm -hmm. and like debit card and all of that yeah. but they had this one app where everything taxis uber eats the lot would was just purchased on the on the phone are they government. microchipped over there uh yeah i think i think probably you mean in the phones yeah even i think they're getting into the skin i don't know if it's happening in sweden but i don't know if china because they're so advanced where they're just paying for things with the wrist that i've heard of that that will probably be next Mm -hmm. And they'll say, like, it will make it easier and more convenient, but it's nice to keep tabs on you, of course, yeah, isn't of course. it? But we've already yeah. got tabs on us. If you've got social yeah. media, you're already locked in. If you've got an iPhone, <laughs> right? Yeah, you're locked in. Because I was doing the, like, the street, the, you know, when people walk the streets and they're protesting, the protest yes. for, like, freedom, but it was all the other shit that was happening a couple of years ago, and yeah. people were having the banners up saying, free the mind and we're free, but... For me, they were all drunk. They were all smoking weed. They were videoing on their mobile phones, and they're so far from name. free. Yeah, do you know what I mean? What yeah. is free? What is free to you? What is free? Free, I think, is you nailed it on the head. I think the more technology we develop and and start sort of having in our lives, the less freedom we'll have. Mm -hmm. People don't see that, do they? They see it as convenient. Yeah, it's fine, but it's it's not. You've got to look to the people at the top. They're yeah. doing it for a reason. I think. So how does a kid from Wales then be breaking? Is it free world records now? Yes. Yeah. And then traveling the world and all over social media. Like, what was the mindset to be doing that? Was that because people always ask you the question? Like, mm. you see runners as well. Say, oh, are you running towards something? Are you running away from something? Probably, probably a bit of both. But yeah. What was the thing in your mind to go right there's something else bigger and better out there mm, yeah you know what and it's funny you say that yeah because i'm always sort of asked like there must have been some childhood trauma that sort of made you sort of push yourself and you know face death many times mm. but honestly i was uh yes i don't come from a, a financial background but uh i had love and support and f um, parents a good family um but I guess I was very curious about the world. You know, I'd watch stuff like the David Attenborough show and I wouldn't want to watch it from the TV box. I'd want to get out there amongst it. Mm -hmm. uh, my granddad lived in Pakistan for over 22 years, you know, so he would come back and share these wild stories. He was a poor man living on someone's roof, but he would still come back and he'd have these sort of experiences for days. Another uncle from Zimbabwe, he would also share these sort of wild stories. And I think a lot of this sort of... Um, played on my mind over the years but in school it wasn't I wasn't really adventurous I was more um, athletic I was into the sports and I guess it's where the pursuit of sort of pushing myself and testing my limits and being very physically active meets the sort of wanderlust and curiosity for the world and for travel different cultures different tradi traditions and sort of that brought in these these early adventures and expeditions but right when I set off to be honest I was in China for two weeks I left China, realized I hadn't really traveled China, just on the coast there along the cities. You know, China's a big country. Ventured over to Cambodia. It was me and my friend. And I remember just pretty much sulking on the Mekong Riverbank, you know, saying we've spent all of this money. We were on such a shoestring budget. It was ridiculous. And I said, and we're sharing the same photo stories, experiences as all of the rest of the travelers. We didn't come out here to stay on the tourist route. We wanted to mix and mingle with the locals. And you know, this first adventure, I believe, was the catalyst to everything to come. You know, pretty much said, let's do an adventure. Let's purchase the cheapest and most ridiculous bicycles we can find. And let's cycle the entire length of Cambodia and Vietnam. And my friend sort of giggled at that, you know, and I remember clearly as if it was yesterday, him saying, let's do it, you know, but on what bikes? And as he said that, there was this noise coming from behind this sort of, ee -ee, <laughs> this screeching bicycle. We turned around and there was this frail old skinny lady, you know, cycling on this fucking awful bicycle, but it looked like a bike that we could afford. Mm -hmm. And we um, literally that day, we spent about 10 pounds on a bicycle no pump no puncture repair kit a non-waterproof tent which cost a few dollars um string on the side of the road that we strapped our rucksack onto the back with 
um, no map, no technology. I wasn't sharing. I wasn't on social media, so I wasn't sharing. I was literally just doing it for the pure passion and love of adventure mm. and travel. <clears throat> and off we went. You know, we cycled over 1,100 miles. We were chased by dogs, hit by mopeds, dodged by lorries. In the last day, we cycled over 39 hours straight, going over 45 hours with no sleep. Um, and I think it's that journey where I found my sort of niche and my and my passion. I remember cycling through thinking, wow, can you imagine at the end of my days, sort of having the world map on the wall and having these lines across different countries of where I cycled or hiked or done some form of adventure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said it quite flippantly, didn't think anything of it, but I knew that because I'd now found my passion, I just didn't want to stop. So I didn't. When do you feel more alive when you're doing stuff like that? Living just the unknown? Um, yeah, I think so. I think it's like, I love a good routine now because I know it's important, you know, sleep, waking up, exercising, having the right food. But back then, I think it was the lack of routine and waking up to a new sunrise, not knowing what's going to happen that day. Mm -hmm. And I think adventure provided me with that, with the challenges that I'd have to overcome, with the with the people that I'd meet. I love meeting new people. Um, and I would meet so many along the road and they've all got stories to tell and experiences of their, their own, you know? Ain't it mad that there's over 8 billion people on the planet? Crazy. As far as I'm aware, like, I've never seen 8 billion people. There could only be 10,000, <laughs> <Yeah>, 20,000. <000. laughs> <laughs> they could bend some fucking simulator. Like, it was a Jim Carrey film. Ah, <laughs> the, the Truman, Truman show. show. Yeah, you just don't know. Yeah. So that's why when you go out there, because when you, you think about it, I've been traveling the same route for forty years, thirty nine right. years on this planet. Yeah. Obviously, I've been in holidays and stuff, but it's the same people. And is and I've always fought Vietnam and travel. I've got kids in that now, so you kind of it eliminates a lot of things. Obviously, until they're older, but I believe. Oh, yeah. Just the world's such a big place and when you see other cultures when you see other people and other beliefs and i love a good conversation i could talk to anybody as, if they can hold a conversation but it's just yeah. when there's so much else out there you just it, i question everything mm -hmm. even down london last night i'm walking about and i'm thinking what the fuck is that about <laughs> yeah. i genuinely don't know i know i'm yeah. doing good and i know i'm doing big things but i'm still winging it yeah there's, got you. there's not really much to what i do i think everyone is right yeah do you feel that when you're just going through the motions like do you feel though like there's a purpose to it and there's something bigger and greater than outside of you when you're doing those things yeah i think i would like to think there's you know a bigger purpose a bit i like to think that i've got it sussed out as well you know the plans of the expeditions and what will come after then but you just don't know mm -hmm. you can you can sort of plan for the worst hope for the best you know but um yeah so see after that cycle where were you sleeping well when you were doing the cycle I was sleeping on the side of the road. The of the road. Um, I remember sleeping a couple of nights in a hammock shop. So you've got the shelters normally for the for the lorry drivers, mm -hmm. for the truck drivers, um, and you've got maybe 20, 30 hammocks, and it's the equivalent of 20 pence to um, stay one night in the hammock. And that's that's how I, it was really, it was an unhealthy cycle. I was eating nothing but noodles. If we could afford it, we would add in an egg and a sausage. But you're talking silly money, mm -hmm. you know, like really, really cheap. Um, and then the non-waterproof tent, sometimes we would get in that and, you know, we found out the hard way that it's the, uh, you know, this one I didn't really know my kit. <laughs> I just purchased a tent and like, I thought, fuck it. But I was always like that, even in my college course, um, age 17, 18, you know, climbing Ben Nevis, everyone would spend their grant, their college grant money on the right equipment. And I would end up spending mine on modifying my car, <laughs> you know, spraying it, a full body kit. And then I would end up trekking Ben Nevis in nothing but Adidas overalls and football tr shoes, football trainers, you know, but I was the one smiling all the way up. I would be leading the way up to the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And I think it's little subtle things like that, where I got curious, not only just about the world and, you know, how big it is and the different traditions, people that you'd meet, but also about myself. I was curious thinking, how were they all moaning and complaining with Gore-Tex waterproof trousers and, you know, the right boots, the proper sort of jacket. And I was soaked, you know, cold, but I was still sort of leading the way up the snow, carving out footprints for them to follow in, mm -hmm. making it to the summit. And um, it was definitely a sense of foolhardiness. It was definitely reckless, but I think I needed that, you know, and even the early adventures that I did, some were illegal, you know, crossing, crossing over borders illegally with no permit, um, especially from Thailand to Myanmar via the jungle, machete in hand. And then we, we came across a Burmese hill tribe and we were learning how to survive in the jungle. 
from hunting and gathering to um, learning how to build rafts or, or shelters using natural resources. They really sort of took us under their wing, but they were kind of illegally trying to migrate into Thailand and we just crossed the jungle, you know, <laughs> machete in hand all the way through. And we were in Myanmar at a time that it was closed down fully. That was 2010. I don't think it opened up till 2012. And then the same with Himalayas, you know, I was told that I needed to purchase some sort of permit and spend mo money on a permit because you can't trek those mountains. But again, I was like, what do you mean you can't trek? It's, it's mother nature. It's, the mountains are open to anyone. And I told him, I said, look, I'm not buying your damn permit. I'm, I'm taking my, my backpack and I'm, and I'm going off. And then he says, well, if you're going to go against my word, I need to at least show you how to avoid the Pakistan army. I was like, what do you mean? He was like, you're on the border here, Srinagar. You're in on the border of India and Pakistan. He says, if you come across the Pakistan military that control the border there, he said, go down on your knees, put your thumbs behind your ears and say, I think it was Allah Harigbi repeatedly, which kind of means, Lord, have mercy on me. And it was at that point I was like, okay, so he's either sort of pushing the buttons to force us into buying a permit or he's, he's legitimately serious. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, I would still be doing these reckless, dangerous, sometimes illegal things. And I think I needed to go there in order to to get here, you know? Did you feel your life was in danger at any point in your first one you done? Uh, the first expedition? Yeah. yeah I, I almost died on the first one. Um, as much as I felt sort of like I had prepared for it logistically, mentally, physically. You know, this expedition, the Mongolia was... So after sort of just bringing it back to the early adventures, after all of the early adventures, I then settled in Thailand uh, for two years. I was a master scuba diving instructor and a Muay Thai fighter. Um, and I'd be fighting effectively to, to pay rent and get free Muay Thai lessons and whatnot. And that life was exciting. I loved it. But I started to miss, you know, the time cycling Vietnam or with the Burmese Hill Tribe mm -hmm. in the Himalayas. So I came up with a plan to maybe walk 100 miles or 200 miles across Mongolia until eventually uh, I realized it was a, a world first record if I was to become the first person to hike across its entire length, solo and unsupported. Um, and that one was, that's where things came to a halt a little bit and I stopped doing sort of reckless adventures. Um, I, I, I was sort of looking into how I can manage it, how I can make it not as dangerous as the Vietnam cycle. Um, I then searched vigorously for those people who had done it before because I didn't know it was a world record at the time. I then bought more logistics in, in, on board, sort of the UK, the Royal Geographic Society, on ground locals in Mongolia. And then it was, we did extensive research and we found someone who had attempted this expedition um, but failed on all three occasions. Um, and I looked into this guy and he was a Navy soldier. He was a, a desert explorer. Um, far more experience, you know, I was effectively a beach bum Muay Thai fighter living on an island, you know, and mm -hmm. I remember writing the writing this sort of email to him, asking him for the dangers, and he got back, he was a nice guy, responded, he says, there's, there's lots of dangers, you need to watch out for the drunken nomadic drifters, the dry wells, the stagnant water, the steep ravines, the wolves, the snow blizzards, the sandstorms, and the list went on and on. And it was at that point for the first time in all my adventures that I actually just nipped it in the bud and thought, no, this is this is too dangerous. I tried to get my friend to, to join me and he was like, no, you're on your own. Uh, but then I realized, you know, just because no one's found a way to do something doesn't mean it can't be done. And I thought with the right preparation, if I can move back from Thailand, back to the UK, I didn't, I had... I had just over 200 pounds in my account after selling my diving kit. So I had to move back in with my mum and dad. So I was living with my parents. I couldn't afford no gym membership, but my uncle sort of is a courier, you know, a driver. So he managed to pick up a tractor tire and a sledgehammer from a farm and dropped it off at my place. And all of the training for that world record was done in my back garden, flipping the tra tractor tire, beating it with a sledgehammer, sort of using a pole where I could do pull-ups. Um, I was doing push-ups, you know, running up the mountains with a rucksack. And whilst I was training physically, I was also preparing myself mentally, you know, because mm -hmm. I just remember being shit scared of this expedition. There were, all the odds were stacked against me and everyone was saying it's impossible. People have tried, people have failed. It's reckless to do it solo and unsupported. The locals who've been doing it for thousands of years, of course, long before we came around, um, they do it as a close-knit community with family members or friends or yaks, camels, so they're supported. And even they were sort of advising me against it. 
So I had a lot of fear and doubt with this one. What makes you then kick on to do it? Is it to prove to yourself, prove to others? Because we hear all the stories now about social media is that motivational and coming mm. from the broken homes and fucked up mentally but they push themselves to extremes David Goggins never yeah. what 40, yeah. 60 or 60, 40 whatever he calls it yeah. you've come to the good home good background loving family Yeah. where did you find that something that ingredient where you don't quit you push on yeah. you never fail it's, we all fail but you know what I mean like to kick yeah. on what's that ingredient that you have I think it was a lot of things I think there was definitely again that curiosity there was that stubbornness so I would say my mindset is um, pretty dogged when I set out to do something I'm a man of my word I like I like to get it done and so there was definitely that stubbornness to it being a man of my word but I don't know maybe it's maybe it's genetics as well you know maybe skipped my parents but my granddad he's a he's a wild one he's a he's a He's mental. Is that him in Pakistan? Yeah, he got kicked out of Pakistan because he overstayed his visa, mm -hmm. and now he lives in India. So he just doesn't like the West. He belong. He like belongs over there. That's mm -hmm. where his. So I've only seen him maybe four, five times in my life. Not really enough to have any influence over me, so to say. But you know, potentially genetically, because he's always pushed himself. He's always been hiking. He's got some crazy stories. It's a proper survivalist. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe there's that too, but I do think it was, I kind of gathered from an, an early age, a very young age that this, this life is going to go fast. You know, how do you want to use the days? And I remember being, I think it was 15, 16 and having that sort of quote on my wall, I forgot who it was by, but it was like, life shouldn't be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving in a well, in an attractive and well-preserved body but rather to slide in sideways, covered in scars, thoroughly used up, body thoroughly used up, screaming, you know, Yahoo, what a ride. Mm -hmm. And I remember I kind of had this vision board. Uh, I didn't know it was a vision board, but I had a world map, you know, to try to help keep me motivated to save up the funds because it was fucking grim working in a fish and chip shop. I was making £3.10 an hour, you know, and then I progressed up and was waiting on and then lifeguarding, which was better money but cycling to and from work at four o'clock in the morning, ready to be on poolside, which is a sleepy job, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I'd wake up, see these quotes, see these pictures from around the world, see my world map of my plans in hand. Um, and I think I always then, I think that snapped me into becoming very goal oriented. Um, and then I wanted bigger things to plan. I think maybe I had planned to travel the world. I had done that. I'd done the cycle in Vietnam, the Himalayas, all of this. And I was just thirsty for more adventure. What was the Himalayas like? That was amazing. Yeah, absolutely stunning. Good people there, are. Huh? Great people, yeah. So I was just in uh, India, north of India, mm -hmm. in a place called Srinagar. How far is that from Nepal? Um, from Nepal? It's probably quite a distance. I think you've got what, Pakistan in between. What's the and mountain Nepal. in Nepal? Um, Everest, Is you it mean? Everest? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's funny. Just it's so it's also there. China, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. you type in uh, or mm -hmm. you, you ask people what's the highest mountain in China and they'll also say on Everest. But I think the easiest access point um, is from Nepal and that's why people go to Kathmandu and then climb it. I think mm. it's harder from China, not just physically, but logistically. And I've yeah. got a lot of experience to try and work with the government in China. It's See, crazy. You've done, you done the first one. How was that feeling for you? This feeling of accomplishment? Was oh. that relief? It was, it was immense. It was a huge relief, especially because, so it was three weeks over the Altai Mountains. Mm -hmm. It was five weeks across the Gobi Desert and then a further three weeks through the Mongolian steppe. And when I say solo and unsupported, I legitimately mean, I know some people say this and they've got like a van following, like has to be about five miles, 10 miles behind them. There was none of that. My insurance was invalid and I had to pull a trailer behind me carrying all provisions needed to survive, but I only had 200 pounds in my account. Um, and so I couldn't afford a factory to build me a carbon fiber lightweight trailer. So I contacted a family friend who built a mild steel, a mild steel trailer in his back garden. So on an empty load, that was 40 kilograms. And on a full load, it was 120 kilograms, 260 pounds or 18 stone, you know, weight of it as a same weight as a heavyweight boxer. So I was pulling that because I need, that was my life, my life capsule. And so 78 days altogether it took, but in the Gobi desert, this is where I almost lost my life because I was slowly becoming dehydrated anyway through the Altai Mountains. And by the time I got into the Gobi Desert, just to paint the picture, it was 40 plus degrees Celsius. The trailer now felt like 500 kilograms because the, the thin wheels that I had, 
it was going over gravel, but often soft sand. So the tires kept digging in. I was a lot skinnier, a lot weaker, and I was sort of rationing my water. And then eventually I came to a water source, which was dry. And as much as I sort of planned for confirmed and unconfirmed water sources, it's easier said than done to ration the water when you're in those temperatures, no natural shade, no clouds, no breeze, mm -hmm. constantly having to hide underneath your trailer, just away from that sun. Um, and then at that point, I was at my worst. I was completely delirious. I was disorientated. I was hallucinating. I was so dehydrated. I could almost feel my organs drying up. And at this point, I still had four days to walk to the next community, which was a confirmed water source. And I had people there where I could rest. And at this point, I had missed the, the point of pickup because my logistics manager would take a good four to six days to get to me if he found me in time, because right now I'm in the center of the Gobi Desert. And I just, I, at that point, I just didn't believe I would survive six days. Um, and so it came fully down to myself, um, whereby I, I started to feel sorry for myself. I started to, you know, I remember passing camel carcasses that had died of dehydration. I remember thinking, fucking hell, if I, if I pass here, will I just be a carcass that people will just, you know, roam past on horseback, maybe have a, have a look in my, in my trailer, take, take the belongings, whatnot, you know, all of these vivid things that went on in my, in my mind. But again, you know, I've been, a, I've kind of always been a big believer in visualization, you know, the law of attraction mm -hmm. and whatnot. And I remember thinking, although I can't visualize four days cause I'm in too much agony, the pain was unreal. I could, I could visualize a hundred meters, you know, I could see a hundred meters. So I decided to walk hundred meters and then hide under my trailer for no more than five minutes because sometimes I'd be under there for over an hour. And then by doing this 100 meter walk, five minutes under my trailer, I eventually it was very slow and painful, but I was making progress and made it to the next community. And it was scary because it was at that point, if I, I, I thought to myself, if I don't keep getting up and, and pushing on, I'm going to die out here in the Gobi Desert. My insurance was invalid as well because I didn't have, um, they don't, they don't insure people who are unsupported in the country of Mongolia. Um, but I, I made it and I just about made it. I remember just collapsing in the community. It took me a good eight days to recover. My urine was pretty much black. Um, but I recovered. I pushed on. And, you know, after 78 days, 1,500 miles, I, I crossed the finish line. And yeah, you're right. It was fucking such a relief. Such a relief. Emotion. Yeah, there was lots of emotion as well. And I remember the last couple of days just really taking it in because I was now in the steppe for three weeks after the Gobi Desert stint. But the steppe was more grassland. You've got your eagles, your gazelle. You have got your snakes and your storms, which you watch out for. But where there's storms, there's water. You know, there's that bit of a safety net um, where I could gather the water. But yeah, I just remember the last couple of days thinking, you know, take this in, absorb this, because, you know, it's probably... It may never happen again in, in a population of 8 billion, as we were talking about. I went over eight days without seeing a single human. Over eight days. What not, was that like? not, It was bizarre. It was, it was scary in a way that I felt Do you question life vulnerable. Then, like you could be not alone, die alone, but it's where there's more pressure on that if you, anything happens, you're fucked. Oh, 100%. And that was the biggest fear that I had in the desert when I was slowly dying. I was like, if I don't keep getting up and pushing on, I am fucked and I am just going to be a carcass. 100%. And I remember in the, in the desert, I spoke to my logistics manager, my local logistics manager before I set off. And I remember telling him, you know, can you imagine how silent it's going to be? There's going to be no light pollution, no noise pollution, probably no insects or animals in certain sections of the desert. And he says, there's, uh, he laughed at me and said, there's no such thing as silence. I remember saying, you know, what do you mean there's no such thing as silence? And he says, I'm not going to tell you. If you're at the point of the desert, you'll figure it out yourself. I was like, okay. And then I forgot we had that conversation. And when I was in the desert, it was super quiet. There was just, there was no insects, no noise, no cars in the distance, no people whatsoever. It'd been a number of days since I saw the last person, no breeze. There was no shift in sand noises, you know, from sand dunes because they, I, I wasn't in that section yet. I could hear this humming noise, this high pitched sort of humming noise. Uh, and I remember thinking, what the fuck is that? I'm thinking maybe it's air or, or something leaking from my water container. So I left my trailer. I walked a few hundred meters away from it and yeah, I was still hearing this noise. Never heard it before. Uh, and then it was at that point I realized that's what he meant. 
there's no such thing as silence because when you're at the point of silence, that's when you can hear your own body ticking over. And as long as you're living and alive, you'll always hear a noise. I was like, fucking hell. I got back and I told him, he was like, yeah, people have heard it. People go mad sometimes in the desert because they just hear this, hear this noise just humming and it's your body ticking over. So see, when you completed that, how long did the high last for? Was it a few minutes, a few days, and it's straight back on, I need to do this again? Or were you, were you content with it then? Um, were you always craving more? I was... I was craving more. I was content. I was I was happy. There was lots of sort of interviews around that. I was retelling the stories, reliving it, but from, you know, a place of being comfortable and access to water. But I remember when I was on Mongolia, I was already planning the next expedition whilst I was hiking Mongolia. And it wasn't in a in a cocky or confident way. It was in a way that I used to try to motivate myself, thinking, well, if I can't complete this, you know, don't even think about the next. And the next was was Madagascar. But I remember Madagascar was, in a way, really spurring me on um, to finish this current mission that I was on. What was Madagascar like? Fucking wild. Out of the out of the 155 days that it took to hike across Madagascar, I swear to God, I do not believe there was one day that was just a simple day's hike. It was challenge after challenge. Um, I was held up at a gunpoint by the military. I had to avoid the jungle because the bandits were in the jungle hiding from the military. I had to cross crocodile infested rivers. I contracted the deadliest strain of malaria and managed to make it to safety a few hours before slipping into a coma. I was sort of hunting, I was gathering, it was machete in hand, hacking through the jungle. Some days it would take 16 hours to cover just 1.5 to two miles. I had spider bites that infected. I had leeches that I was plying off me. It was just relentless. And that, that was very physical. It was only 100 miles extra than Mongolia, but almost doubled the duration because mm -hmm. it was just constant with the challenges. Broke me in many ways. See me again through stuff like that. What do you find out most about yourself? I think one of the biggest ones that I've learned, especially sort of before I did Mongolia, all of that fear. I was shit scared. I had so many nightmares and people, experienced people in Mongolia as well telling me that it's just not possible. Uh, and the same with Madagascar, because we took the hardest route, sort of walking south to north via the interior, coming across tribes that hadn't seen a white person before, while summiting the eight highest mountains. And I believe that um, I was just so much more capable than I gave myself credit for. And that's all of us in general, right? I'm sure you've experienced that yourself, where you've been like, fucking hell. You know, you had lots of doubt, but you went on, you did it anyway. And you realize that you've got so much more capabilities and you're so much more capable than you anticipate. And that's one thing that I learned. Another thing that I learned as well, which I apply to everyday life now, is when I was in the jungle, hacking through, bleeding everywhere, you know, hungry, thirsty, angry, blisters on my hand from hacking, using the machete, hated the jungle, wanted, wanted out after a few weeks, I was sick of it. Um, but there was no other option, you know, it was no one was going to, come and rescue me no one was there wasn't an evacuation plan necessarily it was all really low budget reckless world firsts that i was doing but it was at that point i realized that we can't always be motivated but we can't be disciplined and i never knew that until madagascar in 2015 uh, and now even when i'm sort of back in civilization i i use that a lot and it's just it rings true all the time but i learned that in the harshest and most real way out in the jungles why did you need to carry was that a check-in <laughs> yeah yeah so in order to summit the highest mountain in madagascar called marimacocho uh it's, it's tradition it's it's cultural that you must take yourself a a white cockerel and you must protect it you must feed it you must give it water and in turn that protects you from the bad spirits and witches of the rainforest the malagasy are very superstitious they really believe in witches and, and spirits and so I wasn't just summiting the highest mountain. I was summiting a number of mountains before I got to the highest, but there would have been nowhere else for me to collect a chicken. And so Gertrude, the name that I gave this chicken, I always sort of give sort of names to different things that have joined me on different stages of expeditions, the most ridiculous names too. Um, Gertrude was with me for two and a half weeks. He was perched in my backpack. He became fully domesticated. I didn't need to tie him up when I when I let him out to sleep. He would sleep on top of my tent, shit either side of my tent. He would be sort of chirping um, 
in in my backpack there was like a little compartment whereas if it was raining it was good because he'd always tuck himself in and he would make no, no no noises but if it was sunny he'd be out chirping away constantly in my ear whilst i've got a machete in hand hacking through the jungle frustrated angry flies landing everywhere you know and it's just i was hungry and i had this damn chicken and chicken's my favorite food um but uh yeah you know what, what can i do I, I pushed on and you you release him at the top of the mountain do they really do they give eggs or anything every he few didn't. weeks now no, no. do they normally um well he would work yeah he was a, a cockerel so no yeah chickens, no, no so he was yeah he was a, a white cockerel so no no eggs as such but um and, and yeah um, we only found out i think about a weekend that it was a cockerel because people kept saying he's chicken you'll have eggs other people were saying like he's a cockerel and he just looked like he looked like in between you know how was it letting him go he said it, yeah i was actually yeah i think after two and a half weeks despite the frustration he caused he was a <laughs> he was a he was a warrior he was a solid team member mm -hmm. there was four of us up to that point but um i was kind of hoping he would follow us back down because my guy that i was with was saying like it's, it's taboo you cannot bring him back down i was like come on he was like, no, you'll be bringing the, the bad spirits into, into the community. I'm like, oh my God, okay. But, I, you know, I had to respect that. Yeah, because when you talk about witches and black magic over there, they proper believe in that because yeah. they're not a witch or something at the tent and the, the guy who was like with you has seen it and chased it. This is, this is one that, you know, I'm not superstitious. I'm very, I have to be with my experience, you know, very logical, very, you know, um, thinking in that way that it's got to be something but I don't know, there was those three stories that I didn't have any answers to. So I put out a YouTube video um, and one of them was, you know, in the evening, we, we were strolling upon um, in the jungle, deep within the jungle, in the center of the island. And we had the maps and we came across a community that wasn't on the map. So we were like, wow, OK, this must be a new community that's arrived in this section. Um, but it looked like they'd been settled for a while and they they offered us in i remember it being full moon that night as well you know clear sky they offered us in they gave us like a wooden shack to sleep in there was four of us there was me lever max and suzanne and gertrude um and my take was i woke up in the middle of the night after having a bad nightmare and i see max coming in the into the hut out of breath with a machete in hand and i asked him if he's all right and he was like yeah yeah and then he went back to sleep. I went back to sleep. His take on it, he said he woke up in the middle of the night, looked to his right. Me, Lever and Suzanne were all convulsing in our sleep. Um, he looked to the door and the door was kind of like a wooden plank. So there were slits in between. And he said he saw a silhouette of someone stood outside and he wasn't too sure who it was. He stood up. He saw that we were still convulsing and he shouted, like, hey, or in Malagasy. And this thing outside of the door gave a little giggle, started to walk away. He grabbed his machete. This is what he's translating to me. Uh, walked out and then sprinted after this, what he says is a witch. Sprints after it. And he's a fit guy. He's a strong, fit and fast guy. Sprinted after her. And as soon as she entered the, the jungle, she just disappeared. She just vanished. And he was searching for her, shouting her. And then he came back and said that you had all stopped convulsing then. And that's when you woke up, Ash, and asked if I was okay. And I was like, what? Come on. That, and I was like, well, why weren't you convulsing then? Mm -hmm. And he said, because Gertrude was sleeping right next to me and witches and spirits are scared of chickens. And so it sounded all bizarre. And then anyway, breakfast that morning, the whole community gather and Lever and Max start sharing the story that happened last night. And all, straight away, the community of people start then sharing their own witch stories. And they were acting as if it's fully normal. They were acting as if it's, if, as if it's a pesky wolf that comes by every now and then. And I was just like, looking at Suzanne, because she's like half Belgian, half Brazilian. And we were just like, oh, my, it was like blown. But she was super scared. She never stayed in the tent alone again after that because sometimes we'd stay in wooden shacks but if there was no locals we'd stay in the tent and she'd have her own tent she just she didn't that like really scared her and we didn't know what to think of that mm -hmm. whether it was something which i you know i still don't i i still don't believe obviously but it's it's a case of you know why have they got this tradition and it's been going on for thousands and thousands of years apparently i'm just like fuck knows so that's one story that I'm just like, that's up to the audience. I don't know what to think of it. Mm. Um, I don't know what he ran after that day. I would be shaking myself as well. Doc. Yeah, and we were in the... That, yeah. that, that village wasn't supposed to be there. 
It wasn't on the map. It wasn't on GPS. We were like, what the fuck? And we were in the middle, the center of the island. No one goes. It's a big island, the fourth largest in the world, two and a half times the size of the UK. You know, 80% of uh, plant life and wildlife found on the island is found nowhere else in the world, which means it's one of the most unique uh, countries Beautiful. in the world too. Stunning and so diverse, forever changing. Isn't it scary that there's not a very high percentage of people don't even leave the UK? There's people who don't even leave their own country, their own yeah. street they're born in. They're just so institutionalised with the life around them and that's okay if people are happy but yeah when you see how big the world is and Man. only a very small percentage it is explored what is it yeah. world's at 80 percent water yes yeah, so, yeah 75 80 percent yeah. yeah yeah and it's just and we know more about space than we do our underwater, underwater. yeah yeah because antarctica and that i'm thrilled yeah. i kind of always ask the questions I, you watch the videos unless i see it with more eyes and everything is a conspiracy like who do we believe how do we know if you read something and i read something how do we know you could take something totally different from what i take yeah this is what the world's all about i believe exploring when i do my whole walks in my cold water that's when i feel more alive my energy levels are higher and right. my, my creativity becomes more more clear Mm. more clear yeah the last few months I've just been eating shit feeling, not feeling sorry for myself but just working hard and Got spending you. more time with family you kind of forget the important thing in life and yeah. just looking after yourself is pushing the boundaries and raising the bar yeah. so when you completed Madagascar what was that feeling? again immense yeah um, major I remember sort of getting to the finish line and you know there was no it was the cyclone season and so there was no pick up <laughs> so we crossed the finish line we like woo for the photos took a quick selfie we had to walk two days back on ourselves even after finishing 150 days so it was 157 really but um but once I had you know sort of made it back and it was always a struggle because I always wanted to turn this into a career but I always struggled financially mm -hmm. constantly um and even Madagascar you know, I, I don't mind talking about it now because I'm past that stage. But I think even after Madagascar, whilst I was doing it for the love and passion, I was trying to turn it into a business, into a career. And I was remember filming for, um, you know, a UK channel or Nat Geo for Mongolia, but failed. And I failed to get a book out. And then Madagascar again, failed with that, didn't get TV, didn't get a book. And so it was really hard. So I was still living with my parents then at the age of 26, 27 still trying to grind away and still staying dogged as well because I really, really wanted it. Um, so I knew that the next move had to be big, had to change everything. Um, and I was planning two journeys. One was the Congo River, which I do think, I didn't do the Congo, but I do think whoever does the Congo River walks it as a legitimate world first. I think it will be the greatest expedition the past century, the past hundred years. What was that one? How long? The Congo River. It's not as big as the Yangtze River that I did hike, but it's, fuck, it's suicidal. You know, right through the heart of the Congo, Central Africa. It must be under, just under 4,000 miles, but you've got new diseases coming out there. You've got the hippos, all kinds of snakes and oh, spiders, geez. cannibals still, you know, very remote tribal communities that will fuck you up if they find you. You would need security for that, 100%. Um, Maybe I'll do it one day, I, I, but I, I don't know. I've got a girlfriend now as well. It's been two and a half years. Things get different, don't they, where you don't want to risk your life as much. Then when the um, kids come as well, bro. Then it's, yeah, that's it, right? And that's got to be the fuel as well to kick on and show and, and, and make them proud. Yeah. That like we're all going to fucking die, like you says earlier. <laughs> like why go in straight and clean cut? Go in full of fucking scars, maybe losing an right. arm with a Hannibal, cannibal and being bitten by a hippo. How good would these stories be? <laughs> yeah. You were thrilled by your granddad's stories that's sleeping in a, 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 house, a roof in Pakistan. Yeah. Imagine yeah. you've got fucking three fingers left by getting bit by a hippo. <laughs> You're a legend. <laughs> right, You're right. 4,000 miles. How does that then... What is that? Is that a year, two years? What is that? That was... That's got to be over a year, surely. You mean for the Congo? Yeah. If you were to plan that, I think you would... I think you would hope it would be a year, but it would probably be two. Two to two and a half, I think. That's where legends are made, though. Yeah. That's where it's like somebody climbing Mount Everest for the first time. Yeah. It gets done yeah. every day now. It's exactly. just people go out on an adventure and go, let's climb Mount Everest. It's not yeah. with all the paths and all the training. and Not yeah. is it to climb Everest? Is it 40 grand, 50 grand? What to? Oh, yeah, to climb it. 
I think it probably is. Yeah, it's and the rest probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But and so that's that. never. Um, I don't know. That's never interested me because of that. Yeah, because not unique. No, and yes, it's still it's still hardcore, and you still need the mindset and the physical mm -hmm. sort of attributes. But it's almost you can pay your way up there. And I prefer doing these sort of things that haven't been done. Yeah, you know the, the things. I like that the guy. Is it Nims? Yeah. Yeah. Would he do 14 peaks? He did 14 peaks, yeah. It's just, it's the extraordinary things, the yeah. Congo, and yeah. that's when you stand alone. Yeah. And become 100%. the best and the biggest in the world to do things that nobody else can. Exactly. Same as the guy who done the, was it the, the one mile under four minutes? Nobody could complete it. They said your heart would explode. Yeah. The guy done it, and within six weeks, somebody else done it, and the oh, people do it. Set the trend then, don't you? Auto. Yeah. It's mad, that, isn't it? How it is. something gets done one time, it just then, it's the belief system. Yeah. As soon as you can believe it, and as cheesy as and fucking, as now you can achieve it. It's yeah. so fucking cringe now when I say that shit, but but it's it so, so true, true, and so important for people to understand anything yeah. is possible. Yeah, and I kind of hope that that's why Mongolia and Madagascar <laughs> really stood out, and that's why they were so difficult because, especially to plan, because I couldn't find those people who had done it before. And what I hope in the future is that people are doing speed records there. You know, yeah. I know that people do marathons like all over the world. I know that there's a guy, you know, doing a marathon across Africa. I hope that one day someone does, you know, runs that route or hikes that route and aims to do it quicker. And that's the beauty. You're getting it first. You'll always like Edmund Hillary. You can be, you can climb Mount Everest and be the fastest, but they'll never be first like he was, you know? Yeah. So I kind of hope that I've sort of carved that path with these specific countries and then in the future, I see that people are actually setting speed records. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was pretty much deciding out of the Congo and the Yangtze, both brutes, both very difficult to plan. I think logistically, China was more difficult. I think physically, Congo was more difficult. And so when it came to the finance and how I was still stuck in the rush, I fucking hell, that's two world firsts, no TV, and I'm really no sure. No Yeah. And it wasn't about that at the beginning, you know, because I wasn't on social media, but it became about that because I realized that if I don't manage to make it here, it will either be back to lifeguarding or back to scuba diving in Thailand, mm -hmm. where I'd have to count the pennies to make sure I could get the boat to the next island to have a night out or a good time or whatnot, you know? Yeah. And I just really needed, really needed to make it within this career. And it's very fucking difficult. And, you know, you have got competition and, as much of a legend that he is, um, Bear Grylls occupies all of the channels. And so anything you pitch to any channel, they're saying, mm, yeah, but we've got Bear Grylls. And can you imagine that's almost like a boxer trying to make it and then being like, oh yeah, but we've got, you know, Anthony Joshua. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, but you've got Tyson, you've got Wilder, you've got Uzik, you've got all of these other yeah. fighters. You're giving them a chance, mm -hmm. but it seems that with Bear, it's just Bear and no one, no one else is allowed to do any adventures or travels around the world for TV because we've got Bear. And it was really frustrating. So I thought this one has to be groundbreaking. This has to be sort of legacy. Uh, and then out of those two, the Congo and the Yangtze, the Yangtze made more business and financial sense. <laughs> Not only was I attracted by it because I went there at 19, you know, I'd explored it and I realized, fucking hell, I've barely seen China after spending two weeks and skirting along the coast because it's such a huge country. I realized that there's a, there's a river, the Yangtze River, the longest river in the world to run through a single country and the third biggest in the world. It's, there's like a hundred miles uh, difference between, and when I say hundred, like three, four days hike difference between the Yangtze, the Nile and the Amazon effectively. And so I thought, well, the Amazon's been done. The Nile was pretty much done. The Yangtze hasn't been done yet. So I partnered with Guinness, Guinness Book of Records, uh, partnered with WWF. We produced a documentary for National Geographic. You know, we were now onto big things. Um, and then I set off, but that was difficult. Two years in the making to plan that. Mm -hmm. It's mad though, because like they can say it's not about the money or the fame that is an illusion but mm. when i first started doing a podcast it was three years deep we weren't making anything we were fucking scrimping and scraping just to get shit done just to travel right. sometimes sleeping in the car we would go to a place and it would have to be maybe two or three podcasts squeezed in a day so it, we've not more expenses and then you start yeah. reaping the rewards and start understanding okay because i love what i do and it's, yeah but it's mentally draining of trying to survive yeah. feed the kids but when if you've got a vision if you've got a dream 
then it's always worth it if you just keep pushing through and 100%. because 99% of people quit 99% yeah. of people keep going I think it was if you work on your craft 18 minutes a day for a year you're 95% ahead of everybody else who's doing wow. it wow did you feel that when you started okay I'm getting a bit of recognition does it ease but, uh, but sometimes I feel as if it takes the fun away from it though yeah when you start doing well when you start making money you start getting attention yeah. everything you think because that's not what I, that's not what it's about well, obviously we needed nope. to survive we needed to get to those things but i look back at the journey of the traveling for, driving 10 hours to yeah. get a guest and this will be a guest this will be the breaking one but it's never been a breaking one it's just all been the consistency yeah. of 400 guests yeah. to get to a certain level and look at you now and there's a bit look of freedom towards it but you kind of forget that the journey of because when once you lose that then it just becomes not a habit but I don't, yeah, well, it does fucking become a habit, but there's something, a little thing missing because when you start doing it, it doesn't have that element of what if it doesn't work? Yeah. Because it's working. Yeah, exactly. So you kind of take it for granted yeah. then eventually, I guess, don't you? Mm -hmm. So, see, when you started getting the recognition, was it a bit easier for you to go, okay, doors are open, it's been worthwhile? Because you're putting your life through risk. Yeah. Obviously, you love what you do and you're being proud of what you do. Your family will be proud. Obviously, you'll put them through a lot of fucking torment yeah. with the shit that you do, but. When you start doing it and it starts opening doors, then you go, okay, it's working. Was there a realisation that it was working when you'd done the third one? Yeah, there was. I think even that, it was a lot easier to bring sponsors on board and it was a lot easier to be taken more serious because I've got two world records under my belt. Mm -hmm. And despite people saying how impossible the Yankee was and even the locals sort of going against it and even the government saying it's just not, it's simply not doable and they would point out reasons as to why. I think now I had Mongolia and Madagascar and it was a case of like, look, this is what these people said about Mongolia and Madagascar. I went on, I achieved that. It's down in the history books. It's world first. You can believe that I'm going to do this because I'm going to prepare for it. I'm going to train for it. I've got the track habits. I've built up the, the experience. And so it was easier to convince sponsors. Um, but it was still, you know, I think up to this point, definitely it's in the thousands of rejections, you know, from TV, from sponsors, from magazines, from all, all of that for mm. sure. But I think that also feeds the the hunger, right? It fuels the fight. Yeah. Um, and I just remember just going at it fully. And Nat Geo didn't actually come on board till once I had finished the expedition and Guinness Book of Records didn't come on board until afterwards. They were they were recording it, they were documenting it. I had to take like a vegan system and that would send off like a, a ping to the satellite every five minutes. So it was five minutes, 24 seven for 352 days. That's how long it took me to to hike the Yanks, it was a year. Um, and so it took them about two and a half, three months to to go through it and make sure it was legitimate, make sure I didn't jump on the back end of a bicycle, make sure I didn't use the flow of the the stream because that would be classed as cheating, disqualified. And if I did, I'd have to walk back, which I did sometimes to then, you know, walk back upstream to then walk to, to, to balance the distance out. Um, and so a lot didn't come on board until after the Yanksy. And I remember it even being a struggle to, to bring to get the expedition, the green light, everything was in place. Like I knew sort of the logistics, the production team in Beijing, all of that, but they weren't working. And I was like, fuck, how do I, how do I get them to work? And they kind of said, yeah, you know, maybe plan it uh, for next year. That'll be safer. That'll be easier. So I actually took a big risk and I think you all need to do this in business. And I'm sure you would have done something similar many times, but I took a press release um, to the press. I organized a big event in Canary Wharf, invited all, all sort of press members and I launched the expedition. But at that point, I didn't have the finances. I didn't have the visa. I didn't have the permits to get to the source of the Yangtze, but I attached the different brands and the different names and the lo different logistics and the production team to that press release that now went viral, was now with the BBC World News, BBC um, Channel 4, Channel 5 News, all of that. And that, it was a big risk. My family and friends advised me against it. They were like, look, don't, don't do this. And I was like, look, it's going to work. It's going to work. And they, they, their, their brand, their name was now attached to it. So they're like, fuck, okay, right. Well, and then they started to um, pick up then and we managed to get the green light, but Oh fuck! It was it was difficult. It was difficult. I was given an honorary doctorate, you know, where I was made doctor for one year, mm -hmm. specifically so that I could get um, an ambassadorship role for the Three Sources National Park 
in which I would have then been ambassador for the Green Development Foundation, which I needed to be to access the next national park, in which I had to be all of those in order for the government to take me serious and the government provide sort of protection from the authorities. And eventually the list went on and on, but I had to carry, I think it was 14, 16 signed and stamped documents legal documents to say why I've got the satellites, the satellite systems and the beacons with me and the satellite phone, why I'm here on the border of Tibet, why I'm here in this national park. It was very sensitive when it came to China. In case you're a spy, yeah. military, whatever. Yeah. And I was being, I was being watched for sure. And I was taken in and interrogated five different occasions by the authorities up on the Tibetan plateau because you're now in Qinghai province, but when the police see you there and they don't see any Westerner there really, uh-huh. um, they will then drag you over to the border into Tibet and, and start questioning why you're in Tibet. And you're like, I'm not in Tibet, I'm in Qinghai. And they're like, no, the source of the Yangtze is in Tibet. And I'm like, it's not the source of the Yangtze is in Qinghai, but they've got different paperwork. I've got different paperwork. But luckily, I've got the um, the government to back me up. Mm-hmm. And so because of the good planning and the good team and the amount that China really did have my back, they were forced to to drop me back where they picked me up, which was a rarity and wish me good luck on my journey, you know, and they were probably hating that, but I really had myself covered. What was it like when you completed the third one? Massive. Mammoth. That was... Um, towards the end we had over a hundred different people joining you know for the last few kilometers family friends family friends we had the british consulate um joining we had the wwf um nat geo members and then just members of public uh in china because it was a lot bigger in china the reason it took 352 days is because i was also stopping at cities along the way because my book has been translated into mandarin so i was doing book signings in different cities you know presentations uh, marketing and running events where people could join um and so it was yeah it was big in in china like all sorts of wacky stuff started i remember being called in by gq and adidas to launch you know jetly to launch his um new co-branded clothing range with Adidas and Jackie Huang, who's like a big star in uh, in China. So it really sort of blew up. It went crazy for me out in, out in China. Was that a sense of, okay, I'm doing it. I'm not completed it, but everything I put myself through, the in comas, the bites, away from loved ones, trying to succeed, trying to make something of your life. Was that a moment where you, okay, it's working? Yeah, it was. It was after, it was definitely after the Yangtze because more opportunities opened up then and it was the one show it was all of this good stuff that would bring in more opportunities which would make it easier to obtain sponsors to continue to pursue my my passion and yeah and it's that's mad though isn't it because if you never got if you got sponsors the first time you might not have got as far as you were yeah because it's yeah. good to get the 2000 rejections mm-hmm. and keep going people fail after the first rejection and never do it again it's true you learn a lot about yourself through through rejection and I'm all about that and I think that's partially one of the reasons why I wanted to travel in the first place was to face adversities, to face difficulties, to face scenarios, to put myself in situations which might be embarrassing or dangerous. But by doing that, I'd be learning and I love learning that way rather than the typical sort of educational system, which I think fails a lot of people. Uh, And I think failed me. I had to grow and develop myself through travels, through adversity, through facing rejection, through learning through mistakes and trying never to make the same mistake twice. Yeah, never been dehydrated bad. after the Gobi Desert <laughs> <laughs> and I've never caught malaria yeah. again <laughs> so was that was the third one you'd done three world records you had a book out at that point as well is that correct yeah that was after Madagascar I had a book um, called Mission Possible how was it being an author yeah it was uh, it was good it was great to you know it was difficult for me to sit down with an editor and like fucking get these stories out but I'm glad I did it because there's something there now but I wish I not I wish I would have held back but I kind of want to flesh it out because I feel that I skimmed over a lot of a lot of stories. You know, there was lots that happened in Mongolia. Even though I was offered a wife in the middle of the Altai Mountains. There was just story after story. Is that she good looking? Hey, Is she good looking? Was she? Unfortunately, not. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be fucking shacked. A couple of chickens, couple of kids. <laughs> right. So, how did you end up getting offered a wife? I was just in the middle of the Altai Mountains. I think I was uh, two weeks in. And I came across a sort of concrete hut. This was big Altai mountain range in the distance. Uh, and, you know, where there was locals, they were always very <laughs> hospitable. 
um, but in ways that they would provide you with food, you know, hot, hot water. And this was a Kazakh family. And they invited me inside, sipping on some Kazakh chai for a good 45 minutes, you know, eating some snacks. It was cold, it was windy outside. And I remember thinking, fuck, okay, it's been 45 minutes. I, I need to crack on. And as I went to tell the guy of the hut, I just caught him looking at me very weirdly. You know, very strange and looking at his wife who was sat on the bed breastfeeding his child um, and then looking back at me looking at his wife and I fucking right there right then in hand gestures he points at me he points at his wife and he links us up and points at the bed offering me his wife I was just like awkward for a few seconds I remember looking at him <laughs> I didn't want to offend him by just like laughing and no show, hey, looking at him, looking at her. We were all just sort of awkwardly exchanging, <laughs> exchanging looks for a few moments. And then I put on a fake laugh and, you know, he he didn't laugh straight away. <laughs> and, then, and then he <laughs> laughed and I made a fucking swift exit. She continued breastfeeding the child. Uh, and I, I just remember walking thinking, fucking hell, was that? Like really in this day and age, was that wife offering right there out then? Or... Are they taking the piss out of me now? I'm walking in the outside and they're like, yeah. I'm not that either. We were serious. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Uh -huh. Who knows? Uh, so that was bizarre. So I've got so many stories like this that um, I want to revisit that book, flesh it out. and uh, Just do a new one. Or do a new one. Yeah, because there hasn't been one on the Yangtze yeah. and that. The Yangtze was wild, stalked by, bear, uh, by a pack of wolves for two days, actively followed by a pack. Um, what did they wait for? For you to die, injury. They blood. were so. It's funny because we came across locals who I had my videographer with me as well, and they were stressing concern to us. They were trying to tell us something. My friend was fluent in Mandarin, but these spoke Tibet, so he hadn't. He didn't have a clue what they were saying. But they kept pointing down the mountain. They were doing wolf actions and stuff. But we were like, oh, okay, you know, thank you, bye. But he filmed that, and then anyway, for the next two days, we were followed by a pack of wolves. We heard them howling. There must have been four, or five of them. Um. And they were in close proximity to us for two whole days. They normally cover much, much greater distance than humans. But they were just following close. And we gathered that I think they're looking to see if we're limping, looking for any weaknesses, any signs of injury. Um, but we would eat away from the tent. You know, sometimes we would uh, set up a fire to keep them at bay. And then eventually they just drifted because there was two of us too. Um, but then fast forward five, six months, and my Beijing team, who were putting together the documentary, got hold of the footage and one of them spoke to Betty within the production team and they called me up and they're like, you had no fucking idea what he was saying. I was like, no, obviously not. And he was like, he was saying right down that valley where you're about to walk, there was a lady killed only yesterday by a pack of fucking wolves. I was like, no way. Whether it was the same pack or not, I don't know, but that's what they were trying to advise us against. Don't go down there. So the wolves won't really, it was a, it's a bit of a risk for them to, to attack people, but they do if they're hungry. Um, but there were two of us. We were probably bigger with the rucksacks as well, and there was no signs of weakness. So when you go through these expeditions, do you have to plan what sort of animals will be there if you get bitten, if there's wolves there, if there's fucking hippos, snakes, spiders? Do you need to know what bites are what, what animals are what? Do you need to be on above and beyond of what, what's coming up? Yeah, 100%. No, you've got to. And that's the that's a great thing. I think a lot of people see these expeditions and see it sort of like foolhardy or daredevilish, but mm -hmm. the planning and the, the, the sort of meticulous planning and attention to detail is, is crazy. So it took two years to plan the Yangtze because not only logistics, but because I, I really needed to study the hurdles and the challenges and make sure I fully understood how I can navigate and how I can make it. And it was the same with Mongolia, knowing an, a soldier had failed three times and me not having any, any military background whatsoever. What can I do differently? And so I don't think I would have done any of these expeditions if I wasn't somewhat a hundred percent sure I could overcome all of the hurdles and obstacles. So it takes a lot. And I remember, so with Mongolia, for example, I remember so many people saying it's impossible um, and then I remember... Does that annoy you? Um, it it didn't annoy me. It didn't annoy me. It, it scared me, you know, because I, I, I started to believe them. I started to think that I was, you know, sort of arrogant and naive flying into Mongolia for the first time. Never even been to this country. And I'm there planning to become the first person to walk so alone and support across it. I did feel that, that it was almost um, ignorance yeah. to it. Um, but what I did, I partnered with my logistics manager who was in London. We went straight to the Royal Geographic Society. We got the best maps we could find. And I had to really break it down. I was like, look, it's really getting to me. Which one of these days 
is impossible. You know, everyone's talking about it's going to be impossible, but people have done much bigger, better things, obviously. Which day, if I was to break it down into daily sections, which is the day that I fail? And it was so interesting because it's the first time I really sort of broke it down like that. And we looked at every single day as much as we could, like 20 kilometer days, marathon days, pretty much sometimes as well. And we realized that every day was possible, you know, as long as I had water, access to water and food. Yes, there's going to be wolves, which I'm prepared for. I know what to do. Yes, there's going to be blizzards, which I've got, you know, the right kit. Yes, I'm going to be facing minus 20 in the Altai, which I will prepare for that temperature. And then 40 plus degrees in the desert, which I will prepare for that. All of the different sort of hurdles and obstacles other than invalid insurance and a pretty dodgy evacuation plan because lack of budget, we realize that every day is possible. And I think people just need to do that. I think it, that goes to anything that you're working towards your 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 career, your job, university. You know, if you just break it down and manage your expectations so that you're not overwhelmed by the huge mass of it, uh, and that's what I had to do with the Yangtze, 352 days, and I remember trying to attempt to get to the source of the Yangtze River, and I at this point it wasn't even day one; it was four days to get to the start, and we lost four members of the team due to altitude sickness. Um, so they abandoned the trip or fear of wildlife or just the temperature for members. And then I took my Tibetan guide who was there with me because right now we're at over 5,100 meters, which is over 15,000 feet, similar height to Mount Everest base camp. And so he was there to get me off the mountains in case I suffered with altitude sickness. But he suffered with altitude sickness and that brought me off the mountains to make sure he was safe. And so the first attempt of the Yangtze was a failed attempt. And that does a crazy amount to your mindset, realizing that you've not even made it to the source yet. You've lost four members. You've had to abandon the trip. The first attempt was a failed attempt to get to day one. And then I remember after 10 days of walking along the Yangtze, once we finally got to the source, we faced snow blizzards. We had close encounters with bears. Bears scared the shit out of me out there. There were wolves. It was closing into winter season. I had my UK team and my China team saying, look, abandon the trip and start again next year. We've left it too long. Uh, it's late in the season. The locals are contacting the production team and just abandon it, start again next year. And now we had already lost another few members of the team. And it was at that point I listened to my own experience, you know, like if it was Mongolia, Madagascar, I would have probably listened to them and thought, oh, okay. But I just knew we could make it through previous experience. Like, yes, we were pulled in at this point five times by the police. Yes, we had sort of altitude sickness and all, all, all of this craziness happened to us, but I needed to push on and, and I did. I believed I could get us off the mountains um, before true winter season kicks in, which is about minus 40. And I think the big issue there was the fact that the bears were now coming off the mountain peaks, looking for calories before they go into torpor, which is their version of hibernation. And there were attacks on the locals. They were now going into communities. And, you know, that was something that I feared a lot, but I kind of made sure that I would be staying with the locals where I could, was setting up fires, blowing whistles, making myself aware to the bears that I'm, that I'm nearby. And, and, I, and I pushed on. And if I had stopped, if I'd listened to them, well, the next year was COVID, so Mission Yangtze wouldn't have happened yeah. anyway, you know? You were still trying to... Yeah, I would, yeah it would still now. be a plan and I would still be clawing it back now. Four years behind. Yeah, yeah. How much weight do you lose doing these things? I think with the Mongolia one, for example, because I was pulling the 18 stone trailer, I lost, must have been about 10 kilograms. So, because you're already lean anyway? Yeah. Do you feel that? Does, does your strength for anything go? Yeah, it does, majorly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just remember just, you know, it would be, it's like pulling two more, almost two of me, back then when I was at my skinniest on the on the trailer behind and just i remember like just bones so even the straps were rubbing in and digging in i had like spots and rashes and grazes digging into my skin from pulling this trailer i had to get walking poles to help me because i'd lost the strength of my legs i mean i was dehydrated my lips were completely chapped i remember waking up in the morning and, and having to rip my lips apart because they'd scabbed up and when i would drink or eat sort of ration packs that i had with me put hot water in there I drink from the the ration pack, and as I'd put it down, there'd be a slurp of pus and blood, like a trail into the ration pack, and I just faced a beating. By the time I I'd finished, I looked, especially halfway through, I looked dead. You know, what's the one thing 
it's the hardest when you're doing one of these big expeditions and try to break a world record? What's the hardest thing? I think remembering why you started is the hardest. That sort of goes in the face of different challenges that are life-threatening. You know, I remember, I remember just suffering slowly, slowly with uh, with a disease that I contracted in Madagascar. I had eaten eel that was pretty rotten, but I was in a community that suffered from the bubonic plague, which is crazy, such an ancient disease, and they gave me eel. Um, and I remember eating that, and then my anti-malarial pills were going in one way and out the other, so I didn't really have much protection whatsoever. And eventually, I just started deteriorating, deteriorating, and I was only one month into a five-month expedition. Um, eventually, it got so bad, I realized I was walking four or five days with the deadliest strain of malaria called falciparum, but I managed to just about make it to a community that had overland transport that took me to a nearby city, um, and then a doctor came out. I just remember collapsing on the bed, dizzy, seeing people above me. They were just spinning. She took my blood and she came back and she said, you've got falsipara. She says that if you were three hours later in getting here, you would have slipped into a coma and potentially died. And I remember she was helping to recover. And I, I like to use, you know, positive and negative. The negative is I caught the deadliest strain, which usually kills you within 24 hours. Um, but with that, it's the only strain that you can completely eradicate from out of your system. The three lower strains can remain dormant in your system. And anyway, I, I recovered. I lost again 10 kilograms up to that point. So all of that training that I was doing back at home for this trip, making sure I you know, put a bit more muscle mass on, it just went and I'd still had four months of the hardest section of Madagascar. And that that did a lot. That's when I really needed to to dig deep and remember my my why, my reasons why I'm doing this. I started to hate on everything. I think the the medication turned me a little bit toxic. It was at that point, I just had this almost dark cloud above me. I started hating on the locals, hating on the country. Um, it only lasted for, like for a few days. It was whilst I was trying to recover. Um, and that was a very dark, sort of insidious phase that I went through. Uh, but I did get over that eventually by, you know, by remaining dogged, remembering why I set off to do this. And, you know, I'm a man of my word, I would have hated to have gone back and, you know, the the sort of thought of people tapping you on your back, oh, you know, you tried your best, fuck that, I am going to get up, I'm going to finish this. And I remember doing push-ups in my room, still got malaria at this point, but doing push-ups, trying to eat as much as I could, uh, sit-ups, everything in the hotel room because I couldn't go to hospital because I was infectious. A mosquito bites me and bites someone else, they've got malaria too. And so I could not leave the room again for eight days doing everything there with malaria to train, to prepare myself. And then I left and, you know, I was able to, to crack on. So completing that expedition and facing that, that was, that was up there with the Gobi Desert stint where I really believed, you know, I was potentially going to die. And had all of my parents, my, my family and my friends on the, on the phone saying, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. This isn't a cold. It's not a flu. You know, it's malaria. Um, get yourself back home and then try again you know, when you're hundred percent, but I knew that I was in the country where unfortunately they, they deal with malaria all the time. Um, so the doctors there are very well prepared. So I knew I was in safe hands and I really was. So you've completed the third one. You've broken another world record. You're getting the recognition you deserve. What happens then? So after that, that kind of blew up. It's, um, world news, world news, BBC world news, the one show, uh, good morning, Britain. I was then invited onto the Joe Rogan podcast. It's the biggest platform on the planet. Yeah, which was major. Um, and then I flew back home after that. And literally a week later, I not even a week, I think it was the day or two days after I arrived back in the UK, I received an email from a guy who said that he manages like um, Colby Bryant, LeBron James, Dwayne Johnson, Ronda Rousey, Kevin Costner, and would like to manage me too. I was like, what? What? And so he flew me back out uh, and it was all like very bizarre for me. I was just like, Jesus, didn't expect this at all. Um, and he becomes my manager for the next five, six months, partners me up with Propagate, who film all of, all of Bear Grylls' shows. And we come up with a new concept um, and we film in Mammoth. We're then pitching online to the president of National Geographic, the vice president of Discovery Channel. And things were just going crazy. I was like, this is it, it's, it's set. But um, COVID hit. 
and then Black Lives Matter hit and Nat Geo said, look, we love you. We love the, the take, but you know, you're white and we need that diversity mix. Um, so that hit me after a good seven, eight years working hard for that. And then obviously that came, which I obviously I get, but it was, uh, it was, it was so painful for me after three world records. It was almost racist against myself, you know? So it's just like, it, it is what it is. We managed to put things back up again after COVID and, um, I literally, you know, what, January, I just did this year. I just finished filming probably the biggest step of my adventuring career, which was a six time one hour TV show following the entire length of the Great Wall of China, which will air internationally on TV this year. How long did that take to make? Four and a half months. And we filmed 600 hours for six hours documentary, which is crazy, mm -hmm. right? And this was a different ball game. This wasn't, it wasn't a mission. It wasn't a world record, but it, it was big. And it was like lots of different, it, rather than hiking and surviving, it was going back onto my roots, you know, which is sort of air activities, sea activities. So we were in helicopter. We were scuba diving the Great Wall, which I didn't know was a thing. We were wrestling, you know, Mongolian wrestling in Inner Mongolia. Um, I was at the Shaolin Temple as well, training with the monks there. It was just, it was immense, you know, finding out the history of the war as well as, you know, getting the local story on the war. So a lot of people don't really know what I was doing on, on the Great War, not fully because I hadn't really been able to talk about it. Because you're still young. How old are you, 27? 32. 32? 32. Because you're not, you started over at a young age, 18, 19, did you not? Yeah, yeah. 19 I started I set you out you look young as well you look fucking fresh oh, I, yeah, I appreciate that yeah. I can't believe you never got a job because you're white if that was <laughs> says against any other race in the world it'd be fucking massive yeah it would be it would be but again I don't sort of shout about these yeah. things I guess I just have now yeah, maybe, still you know bad. I mean? it's still bad as well it like is no, if that was says against any other race it would be fucking shouted from the rooftops a hundred percent it honestly it it broke me i was just so angry especially because all the hard work and effort and now i was finally getting my time to speak with the big boys mm -hmm. you know the president of nat geo vice president of discovery this was my time eight years in the making three world records have i done it have i broken through and they're like sorry you're straight you're, you're white and, and we're uh, <laughs> mental. Welcome to the world, mate. Aren't yeah, it? painful. And I couldn't shout about it either because people will take it the wrong way. You, too, be, you so. would end up being a racist. I would be. Yeah. yeah and that's yeah. the environment we're in. We, we yeah. can't say what we feel without people getting upset. And no, we've got to just put up, shut up, and yeah. like, onto the next record. But if we talk about, yeah. So after all that, COVID is over. You're making waves again. Yes. You're everywhere again. Yes. On the James English podcast. Yeah, exactly. We can't get any bigger, bro. Love it. Is, uh, so what happens now then? You're just waiting for the next one to come on TV? Yeah. So it will take them a good... Th we are almost there. I do the voiceovers this month mm -hmm. to the show where it'll finally be sort of done. They've, they've, they've gone through... Released this year? Released this year. Or early next year, maybe. You know how long these things take. Yeah. It could be a while. Yeah. It could be a while. I hope this year, but you're right. It could be early next year too. Um, and you know, so yeah. is this your first TV show ever? I did have the Yangtze on National Geographic. Mm -hmm. That was a two hour, um, two part, one hour documentary, but that was only aired in, well, it was aired across Asia, Africa and the Middle East. Yeah. Why never UK? Don't know. Cause they're fucking from the UK. I know it's, it's, it's crazy because I've had such, and again, it's, it's not like I, I deserve support because I know I don't, you know, it takes hard work. You've got to earn that respect and whatnot, but it's just frustrating how America and China have got my back so much. And China really invited me and wanted me to front this great war documentary. Mm -hmm. They could have picked anyone. Um, and the UK, it's just, it's such a struggle. I'm struggling with agencies, yeah. with management in the UK. No one wants anything to do with it right now. But I do think if we secure a UK channel with this great war, it, it will then all change. Uh, so everything's happening. Big TV show. First time in the UK? Uh, we hope. We've not secured a UK channel yet, but we are pretty confident. Uh -huh. there, was a, there was a UK channel that came on board. And they're a UK channel that I was working hard towards for years and years and they finally came on board we popped the champagne bottle but then i think it was liz trust who came in as prime minister and something had changed whereby they couldn't um work directly with government funded projects in china and, that's for you. and that, that dropped but i'm hoping 
they will come back on board again because they can't post edit. They just can't get involved beforehand. Bear Grylls, he's retired now, is he not? He's he's still going, and you know we've had shows that we've pitched to Amazon and whatnot, but they're like, no, we he's can't. He's a golden boy, aren't he? Plus, he's yeah, done it for years. He's major. Yeah, he's um, done it really. Right, I respect to him. Yeah, but, of course, uh, of course. But that's the level you want to get to. That's the guy you want to not even be, but better than. Yeah, he's killed it. He's made these millions. Yeah, I, 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 I thought I read something. It was it was moving away and retiring. Oh, maybe it could be a couple be. of weeks yeah. ago. He was just giving it all up. Could maybe be. I read it wrong. I could be just totally talking bullshit. But I did see somewhere that it was fucking off and coming off the radar. Ooh, that would help me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah because so business, mate. You've got a missus in that now. You want to provide. You want to do nice things. You yeah. want to eat good. Yeah, you want to be eating fucking noodles, dying with malaria. No. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, I want to stop risking yeah. my life. I still want them to be extreme and ambitious, but. I want the team there. I want the evacuation plan. I want yeah. the valid insurance. You, you know, want the big fucking camera crews and yeah. And it's not like what I do. It's not a man and his mission. You know, with with Mongolia, I raised a certain amount of funds for the Red Cross, and I was raising awareness for climate change and the effects it has on the nomadic way of life. And then with um, Madagascar, I became because I promoted so well the island of Madagascar. The minister invited me back and made mm -hmm. me ambassador of tourism for the for the island of Madagascar. And I was also partnered with the Lima Network Conservation and Shine and all the immense work that they do uh, to help protect and preserve all the unique biodiversity of the island. They've got 60 on-ground teams working to help. And then again with China, I partnered with the WWF. I was again, I was providing water filtration bottles to communities that can't have fresh drinking water. So I was providing presentations, thousands upon thousands of bottles, which allows them to drink fresh um, with a built-in filter, um, providing... Um, work with the WWF with um, who is UNICEF as well along the way mm -hmm. and so it's never I never like to look at it as one man and his adventures where I've done an adventure I'm always trying to give back whether that's um, monetary value in raising funds or raising awareness because mm -hmm. it's crazy when I learn what's going on and it is close to my heartstrings after seeing the world and traveling since 19 I've gone back to places that are now worse off than what they were plastic everywhere and being a scuba diver I see it all in the ocean and so, you know, that's something that I also uh, push and, and promote and try to help where I can. Do you see a lot of poverty in these third world countries? I do. A lot I of do. pain, a lot of suffering, a lot, lot of pain. living a life. It's one of those where... Because we're too, we can be too spoiled here. Yeah. We've seen we've got everything, we've got food, we've got water, we've yeah. got whatever the fucking food and water's poisoned, whatever, we can go down that route, but yeah, yeah, I, I know genuinely what you mean. don't know, so... yeah. It's just, well, I do know actually, but that's for another story. But <laughs> you don't, do you think we're too spoiled here when you look into these other countries? Are they actually living their life, just doing the normal thing, providing for their family, making meals, working just to survive? Or is there a lot of struggle there, a lot of unhappiness? Well, it's funny. It depends on the country that you're in. But with Mongolia, for example, I remember once they had fed me up, you know, let me stay in their, in their white felt tent, their gur or their yurt. I would offer them money at the end of it and they would almost look at me in disrespect. Like, we don't need your your money. You know, look look around you. We're rich in terms of life, in terms of close-knit community, in terms of family. And I was just like, wow, that's so interesting how they just looked at the cash and just thought, oh, we don't, we, we, we're the rich ones here. You know, because they're rich not in monetary value, but in having the help, like this land that they've got, they've got all the freedom in the world to do what they want, to go where they want. They could go on horseback and ride a thousand miles and still be in their own country, see all the world wilderness, the nature, see their neighbors along the way, you know? And so it was interesting how people that I assume don't have much feel like they have it all and they're doing life the right way and are happier than people over here who seem to have it all and seem to have it figured out. But then south of Madagascar, that's when, this is where I saw, so you've got like sort of a, a well on the beach, mm -hmm. which is slightly filtered salt water. And the locals are, have just set up a, um, a, a shelter using natural resources. So bamboo, you know, banana leaves, all of that. And that's their home. And they've got like five kids. There's a wife, a, a, a husband. And at 3 a.m. he wakes up, he goes out fishing at 3 a.m. every morning. He then walks like 10, 15 miles to trade the fish that he caught, half of the fish for rice, and then walks 10 to 15 miles back and feeds his family. And that's it every day. Slightly filtered salt water, not making money, fishing, trading on that barter level for rice, and then coming back feeding day in, day out, Yet they were, again, you can see they're suffering. You can see their teeth are falling out and, you know, they're probably in pain, but they're smiling and they didn't really want much from you. And I don't know. I don't know what that says, 
But then you come back here and many people are happy, but many people are also not happy. And, you know, is that down to the fact we have too many opportunities now? Mm -hmm. Is it down to the fact that we're told from a young age that you can do and be anything you want, but then we're not guided on how to achieve it? You know, what is that? What is that down to? It's almost like too many options we've got. So whereas they have one option, they just wake up, they need food and they need water. And as yeah. long as their family's there, that's it. Food and water, sleep, food and water, sleep, food and water, you know, but here yeah. it's too many options and then we get bogged down Confusing. and then we don't have the goal that we need to set ourselves. And I think that sets a lot of people into, into depression. And, yeah. you know, I think Tyson Fury said it, said it well, didn't he? He was like, once he achieved, you know, he, he was on top of the world heavyweight champion, but then, you know, he wasn't training, training for what? He didn't have a goal. Mm -hmm. What goals can he pursue now? And he just went down that slippery slope, didn't gotta he? Have like You've you got to have purpose. You've got to have confusion here. Yeah. You can go right back to the school and you can go right back to as soon as you're born, you're labelled, you're given a name, religion. Yeah. And I've been saying this frequently, we're given, women are given buff wrong, they're doing it lying in their back under artificial lights, some kids are coming out drugged up with all the medication women are getting. I don't know, like you're, you're from a young age, it's all conditioned program. It's yeah. when you break away from it and question it, you think, what is schooling about? Mm. You're not getting taught about self-love, you're not getting taught about confidence, you're not getting taught about right. money management, you're not getting taught about grieving because we lose people sometimes people can lose a loved one and they go off the, the rails for for eternity yeah. forever yeah. lose a mother a father a brother they go they, they go they don't know how to handle grief no pain is the thing that makes the world go around just as much as love people, yeah. bad things going to happen it's how you deal with it. it's how you kick on it's how you fucking go do you know what your prime example you've used the pain as fuel mm. not wanting to quit i don't need to go home i've got malaria but do you know what i'll push through that belief system people get cancer I'm dead. I'm sure as fuck they'll die. Mm. Some people believe I'm going to fight that nothing happens and that internal belief system, whether that's the brain, the conditioning, the neural pathways, whatever it is you tell yourself. Sometimes people I actually listen to a doctor and he says people get cancer mm. and they don't even know. But because they keep active, that it just goes away itself. Whoa. Uh, Joe Dispenza, who I always touch on, car crash, broke his spine, laying in his bed for six weeks straight, kept visualising his spine getting fixed all click back together Fucking guys a motivational hell. speaker so with the mindset mind power the power of the mind and we only use what eight percent ten percent the same yeah we're so done down with the pineal gland in the middle of the brain and how we can activate that to fucking feel different things and there's a lot of shit you can get into i'm not on i'm not a hundred percent sure on everything mm. i just know how to push through the pain and when you push yeah. through those dark clouds the daylight does come the sunrise does appear and and that's the beautiful thing yeah so everything that you've achieved everything that you've done you've got a tv show coming out when are you at your happiest um when am i at my happiest i think in general i'm i'm quite a happy guy mm -hmm. anyway you know i i'm one of those where i enjoy the extremes as much as i enjoy the luxury mm -hmm. you know i think when people think of what i do they probably think that I'm, I'm sort of always extreme. But no, you know, I like the luxury. I like my comforts as well. Um, I like going out. I like being in the city as much as I like being in the wild. I think for me, it's having the balance and that's when I'm at my happiest. I think if I have too much of one thing, it starts getting to me. And if I'm too in the city for too long or I haven't, you know, pushed myself or tested myself or I'm not training as well, I start getting a little bit ratty, a bit on edge, a bit fidgety, mm -hmm. a bit like, right, I need to plan the next thing, you know, I need to escape and like go out into the wilderness and, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't need to do a big expedition for that. It could be just a, a getaway. It could just be a hike or it could be something fun and an adrenaline thing or like a fight or training to fight or whatnot, you know? Did you used to fight before you went to Thailand? I was a boxer in Wales. Mm -hmm. So I was boxing in Wales um, and then in Thailand, that's when I got into, into Muay Thai. And just realised it was totally different. They just kept jacking up my legs. Yeah, Muay Thai is a different breed. I had on Muay Thai in Glasgow in the grip house. Yeah, did you? a guy called Sean Wright on Absolute Beast. He was in it. Oh, I think it was the contender back then. Okay, yeah. Muay Thai fighters, but he broke his shin. But what a fighter this kid is. And he's, he went to Thailand, opened his own gym. Got the you. thing about the grip house, you would never see, think of these guys as fighters. Right. You would see them in the pub of the street and think, I could fucking take him. Yeah. These guys are killers. Yeah. Proper fucking killers. They are. And the training, everything, the extreme shit. It's like a fucking mental thing. 
You've got to be mentally disturbed to be a fighter. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. There's got to be a screw loose <laughs> All right. to get in fight and get in spa. There's got to be... Because I remember training for my fight in the sparring. I was scared. Mm -hmm. I still get scared sparring, but there's an element of excitement as well. Yeah. And after that, you feel like a man. Yeah. There's something to say. I'm, I'm, ha I'm not made of glass. Yeah. I can get hit. I can throw a punch. And Humbles you. I believe everybody should do some sort of combat. I think Especially so. boys, because a lot of men are becoming sensitive and yeah. weak and fucking soft now. And I believe there's got to be an element of combat and learning it. You don't need to go about fighting everybody, but there's something in that training and pushing yourself because we're warriors we're, we're fucking animals yeah. we're, we're forgetting that yeah. because we're all becoming so fucking sensitive and soft and you can't say certain things I'm at a stage I don't give a fuck yeah Do you know it's, what I mean? it's the most primal form isn't it I think one on one sort of combat mm -hmm. and you're right I think we all need to I'm actually putting a video out this week on self defence and how learning it has saved me and others in certain scenarios. Mm -hmm. I've been attacked many times, as you could probably guess, you know, my, my adventures. In fact, not even on my adventures, just um, a guy in Amsterdam this year, how he he went to attack me and my girlfriend and he had a pen, tried stabbing, and I just, again, rear naked chokehold against the pole. Um, and all the kids and, and adults got to escape that carriage until people then dragged him off and kicked him out. Why? He, um, I remember I was just walking with my girlfriend onto the platform and he was a bit of a lunatic. I don't know if he had mental health issues yeah. or if he was drunk or on drugs, but I just remember him walking towards me saying, I'm going to fucking punch you in the face. I was just like, whoa. And so of course, you know, I stood my ground then we were just back and forth. And then I, anyway, we left it. I realized, oh my God, I can smell whiskey or something. Um, I got on the train and as I got onto the train, I saw him enter the same train in which that point I should have just like got off the train because I should have known what was going to come next. But I didn't. I got on the train. I sat down and I'm in the carriage. There's a uh, there's a guy, there's, you know, a husband and wife with their kids. Uh, I'm sat down and next thing I look up and there's this guy breathing heavily, looking at me, water in his eyes, eyes wide open and with a pen in his hand and he's just like grip tight and then I just acted straight away you know grab his hand um disarmed him of the of the pen I shouted he's got a knife so that people will clear the carriage gave him a few kidney digs put him up against the the, the, the center pole in the middle of the the train um and I just remember holding him there thinking I've just either got to choke him out now or just hold him here until the next train stop um and you know if I I do think that if it wasn't for the previous training or knowing how to act, you know how sometimes once you've fought or sparred quite a lot, eventually your adrenaline doesn't kick in as much as it used to mm -hmm. kick in. More calmer. Yeah, so I was able to act, you know, calm. I was cool. I was collected. You know, it was just steps that I did um, to hold him in place, making sure he wasn't harming me, my girlfriend, anyone else on the on the train. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, no one was was harmed because of it. Uh, but it's happened time and time Isn't again. I'm mad. Being... You've been through fucking uh, all the expeditions you've done, ma malaria, fucking yeah, nearly dying, comas, and then you go to Amsterdam for a weekend with your missus to enjoy life, and then your life's more at risk. Yeah, crazy. And that was my that was my second day in Amsterdam. I got make you question it then and think you're doing the right thing by getting away with the madness because you never know who you come across and you know life's too short. Yeah. There's mad, mad bastards everywhere, male everywhere. and female. Yeah. Especially in cities. Everybody's, like I said earlier, everybody's confused. Mm -hmm. Why people are just filled with anger and hate. It's not that they're bad people. It's because they don't know what's making them feel like that. It's yeah. because they're stuck in a little fucking mouse wheel just going round and round and round and not achieving fuck yeah. all. Restless, not 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 sure what to do with life, you know? Yeah. It's uh and yeah, you're right. It's it's crazy. I remember coming back home when I was twenty after travelling, came back home temporarily, went out uh, on a night out and one of my friends was just attacked um by this guy. And I broke it up, you know, settled it and then walked this guy off. We were all, all drunk. Next minute, this guy hides around the bush and then he runs up from behind me. Boom. Just clean knockout. Smash my head against the pavement. It's, uh, and I had just traveled and I'd done the Burmese hill tribe. I had done all sorts across Southeast Asia, broke down in the outback bushes of um, Australia, you know, where I had to hitchhike for a number of days, you know, crazy things. And then that happens in my hometown in Clandidno at the local nightclub. I'm just like, fucking hell. And people say, oh, it's dangerous when you travel far. Dangerous wherever you go. Yeah. There's dangerous people everywhere. There's psychopaths everywhere. Go and the same happened in, in Madagascar where I was attacked by two Malagasy. 
um, locals, but I remember it, it threw me back to the night out where I turned my back and now I never turn my back. And I handled myself against two Malagasy, um, sorted them out. And then security guard came out. When I say secure, he was secure for the hotel because in Antananarivo, the capital of Madagascar is pretty dangerous. And this was over money for a taxi. They wouldn't let me out. So I got out, I threw the 50 note on the, on the taxi seat, which is what they had agreed, but now they changed it to 500 because there was two of them. And, but I knew Muay Thai by then. So it was like a straight right. And the other one received a roundhouse kick right to the way, you know, it was good, connected well. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the security came out and he told me, he said, take a walk around the block. By the time you come back, they'll be gone. I was just like, well, okay. So I took a walk around the block and, and they, they were gone. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, who owned that hotel? Must have been mafia, must have been someone. That security guard had to have said something like, you're fucking at the wrong part of town here. This hotel belongs to blah, blah. And they were gone because I was worried maybe they'll try to come back because now they know where I'm staying. But they didn't. So I was like, fucking hell. Mm -hmm. You don't know who owns that, that hotel, yeah. you know. But again, it, it goes back to what you were saying. I think it's vital to learn self-defense, to know how to handle yourself. Why wouldn't you want to know how to handle yourself either? You know, I think yeah. more and more younger lads need to do it. If I had it my way, I would, at the age of 16, 17, schools, they should have an initiation test where they're dropped in the middle of the desert or the jungle. They're going to be safe. They're going to be fine. You know, they're supported. Mm. But I, I just think it broadens your horizon. It opens your mind. And then they'll come back and they won't complain to the fact they have to walk one mile to school or the fact that their mum didn't do the washing today and they're mm -hmm. doing it tomorrow instead. You know, because when they're out there and they're left to their own devices, they're effectively self-sufficient. And then they come back to civilization. They realize just how good and comfortable we've got it. And we yeah. complain over the little things that are super convenient. Mm -hmm. Yet we still find a way to shout and moan about Definitely, it. Bro. What about plans for the future, Ash? What's the, where do you take things? Um, I think as soon as this Great War show uh, goes live, I want to take different ideas. I've got some great ideas. A couple of them are world first. Others are just great TV format concepts that I think will do you know, very well globally. And I want to sit down with a few different channels, a few different commissioners and, and run these ideas past them because you know, I'm not... I'm not done yet. I feel like I'm still getting started. Um, oh, you're back in your prime. You yeah. kind of understand that. You understand the preparation. You understand how to survive. Mm -hmm. You understand what it takes to break records. You understand that you you understand the patterns. Everything's patterns. Everything yeah. moves. It's yeah. like a chess game. So it's true. It's about doing that fucking, what is it, the one you wanted to do? The, oh, the Congo. The Congo. Yeah, I guess if Discovery or Nat Geo came and they were like, look, here's your budget to mm -hmm. do that, maybe I would, uh, yeah, maybe I would. Yeah, if I believe you would. You've yeah, got to be new heights. You've got to keep leaving a legacy where people go, fucking hell, he's done it. <laughs> yeah. I want to be there. Bear yeah. Girls, he's done it. Listen, he smashed it. Yeah, it's yeah. It's time for new fucking blood to come through and show yes. what can be done, bro. Yes, right. <laughs> what do you think looking back at your short-lived life so far, mate, that you've fucking everything you've achieved? Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. You're lucky to be alive. <laughs> you know, <laughs> lucky to have survived. That's a, that's a lot of near deaths. Um, but I've learned from every every one of them. And I, you know, maybe some of it's luck, but I do thank the preparation as well. I think preparation is, is key mentally, physically, just understanding. Um, but yeah, it is, it is crazy. Sometimes the stories that I tell, it's just like it didn't, like it happened to someone else, you know? Mm -hmm. What's all your social media is? Where can people buy your book? Yeah, social media. I'm on all of the, all of the platforms and it's just Ash Dykes. Um, and then my book, Mission Possible, is on Amazon. Mm hmm Listen, mate, for coming on today and telling your story. I thoroughly enjoyed that. You've got a, you're a great storyteller. Appreciate you're doing that. massive things, mate. Proud of you. And I look forward to seeing what you do for the future, mate. Appreciate that, James. Thanks Would you for like having to finish me. Finish up on anything. Um, just I I hope people enjoy the the podcast and mm -hmm. you know all of these stories that I tell. Um, I if they can find a way to relate that to their everyday life, that's that's my main aim. Mm -hmm. So that they can take little nuggets from what I've learned in the extremes and apply it to to mm -hmm. their everyday life. For anybody that's maybe watching us, that's maybe in a struggle in life right now, what advice would you have for them? I would say, keep going. You know, I always use this method when I'm on an expedition. I always tell myself that the storm hasn't come to stay. It's come to pass and that you must be stronger than the storm and you'll see better days. Love it, brother. Listen, God bless you and I look forward to Appreciate seeing you. Appreciate that, too. James. Take Thanks care. for having me.